Today's reading comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 to 24, the armour of God and final greetings. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit of all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you may also know know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you Peace to you, the brothers, and love with faith from God, from the, with God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. This is the word of the Lord. Today uh, we are looking at the theme, How to Be Strong, from Ephesians chapter 6. And I've got to tell you, it's, a, it's certainly... Um, a test of strength this particular AFL season for Crows supporters. It's a test of strength. But but I thought this morning I I might start off with giving you a demonstration of a, a supreme strength. So I've been psyching myself up for this. One, two, three. We are the power from port. It's more than a sport. It's true, Port Adelaide tradition. We'll never stop, stop, stop till we top, top, top. There's history there in the making. We've got the power to win. We'll never give in till the flag is ours for the taking. Power! <laughs> How to be strong. Life is a, a battle. Um, uh, Job 5, 7, one translation of that. Life for man is warfare. Last week, uh, James was focused on that, looking at verses 10 to 13 uh, in our series on Ephesians 10 to 13 from chapter 6. This is the last one this week. We're following on from that. James was talking about the spiritual warfare that we are all a part of against evil and demonic power. Uh, and it attacks humanity. It attacks God's creatures made in his image and especially his people. And uh, we can have a true and full life as God's people now and eternally only if we conquer that evil power. Uh, Revelation 3.21 says, To those who conquer, they will be seated with Christ. So um, Ephesians 6.14-24 today how to be strong and to conquer and with a particular focus on the armour for the battle that we need to be able to do that. And so we're going to explore that today uh, looking at three things. Firstly, who is the warrior? Secondly, what is the armour? And thirdly, how do we use it? So who is the warrior? That might seem a, a strange question. Uh, well, us, we, it's talking about us involved in the fight, the battle and the armour for us to use and that's true. But 
the most important warrior in the Bible is God. And we can't understand how we engage in that battle with evil until we first understand God's action first. So in the Old Testament, God fights for his people against their enemies and defeats them. says that in a number of places. Come to the New Testament and Jesus comes as the Son of Man and that's a figure that uh, features prominently in the book of Daniel who would come with all the hosts of heaven to completely destroy the enemies of God and his people. And notice in Ephesians chapter 6, it is talking about the armour of God. So it is God's own armour. It is essentially armour that God wears and he wields before us. And um, we're not talking about religious militarism here. Even though the figures and the symbolism is about battling, uh, it's not militarism. We're not talking about a Christian jihad. It's not talking about actual swords and guns and military might. It is essentially a spiritual battle. So... Don't go and join a Christian militia in the hills somewhere. But why is it that God, Christ, is the most important warrior in the whole situation that we're looking at? Well, it's because only he can defeat Satan and evil. Uh, The psalmist says, as we heard earlier, if the Lord isn't on our side... Our enemies will swallow us alive. And so we're going to sing in uh, a little while in Martin Luther's great hymn about spiritual warfare, um, A Mighty Fortress. He says, we will lose if the right man is not on our side. Who's the right man? He's talking about Jesus Christ. And so... He's the most important warrior in this battle. So then how do you and I engage in that battle? In Christ, it's Paul's favourite phrase, comes right through the book of Ephesians, says it again and again. All that we know of the truth and reality of, of the life God has called us to and given us is in Christ. Uh, Paul says in our passage here, we are to stand in the battle, where are we to stand? In Christ. And so we dwell in him by the power of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. We know that reality through faith. It says in verse 10 in Ephesians 6, be strong, saying to you and me, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. And I don't know, I get this image of Uh, Those of you who are uh, Tolkien fans and fans of the uh, story of the Lord of the Rings, um, in the story you see the the character of Treebeard, who's a living, gigantic tree, and the tree and all the other trees go into battle, these great, mighty uh, beings they are, and sitting on Treebeard's shoulders are these two scrawny little hobbits. And they are there and they're going into battle resting on the shoulders of mighty tree beard. It's something like that. You and I rest on the shoulders of the mighty Christ going in to battle. And we go through the battle, but we stay there, standing on Christ, resting in him. And the most important thing to understand about Christ as the primary warrior in the battle of evil, is that he has won. Satan is an already defeated foe. Satan holds power over us by the guilt of sin and Jesus took all of that, the guilt of our sin, on him and he paid for it in his death on the cross and destroyed it. And so Paul says in another place, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, 
triumphing over them by the cross. So Satan's fate was doomed that day. And so um, we can understand history a bit like the, the famous illustration of the New Testament scholar Oscar Kuhlman where he compared the day of the cross, Jesus' death on the cross, like D-Day at the end of World War II. It was the decisive battle of the Allied forces against the Nazi powers, the Axis powers. And that day, D-Day, doomed the Axis powers. It was the decisive blow. From then on, there was no chance that they were ever going to have success. They were doomed. But it was about a year later until VE Day when victory in Europe was finally declared, when the whole mopping up had been done and there was finally peace amongst the people. But you see, between D-Day and VE Day, there was still a lot of skirmishes going on. Uh, there was a lot of battle still happening even though the doom was secured. And it's a little like we live in that intervening time. And you see, in that time, we, in the battle, we stand in Christ and stand on his already completed victory but the skirmishes are still happening, they continue. And uh, full victory won't be revealed until the last day, Christ's second coming. And so in the meantime, the enemy, Satan and evil, will do their worst. They're filled with hate and they want to keep doing whatever they can to take as many down with them as possible. So we need to be aware, need to be prepared, need to be fully armed. So it brings us to our second point, what's the armour? And uh, we first need to just see how we are attacked in order to know what the armour is that we must use against that attack. And so principally, Satan and evil's attack is on the truth. Satan is principally the father of lies. Jesus called him. You know, sometimes we can think of spiritual warfare that it's sort of mostly to do with paranormal manifestations of evil and, you know, demon possession. Uh, we might think of the, the movie The Exorcist um, and uh, that can be the case. And some of us have experienced those kinds of encounters. But... That's not what it mostly is. Mostly, essentially, the attack of evil is through lies and deceit. So, um, you know, you won't see, usually, you won't see the effect of evil in a person's life by their head spinning around and them vomiting up green vomit. You know, like the popular images in the movies. No, um, someone once said... Satan doesn't leave claw marks on the face, he lays lies in the heart. Lays lies in the heart. And that's actually worse than demon possession. Uh, Jeffrey Bingham uh, once said he would rather have to exercise a demon than get a person to give up a lie that's in their heart. In other words, the exorcism would be easier than getting the person to give up the lie, their resistance to the truth. So the chief sign of Satan's presence and action is lying. And so Satan attacks the truth in us in a million ways, suggestions in our thoughts, uh, through the comments of others who might snub us or criticise us or insult us, or it might just be in having a really bad day when the credit card bounces at the checkout, you know, and we hear the, the suggestions at the back of our mind, you're no good. Others and God, they won't accept you. Or you've failed again and you always will. Or it might be suggestions like, well, you're okay, but they're not. 
They're losers. You're better. And uh, they've wronged me. And I can never forgive them and I'll, I'll get them back. And, you know, when those subtle lies come and we embed them in our hearts and let them stay there, we end up acting on them and they distort and destroy relationships and lives. They are arch-demonic evil. How might someone believing, growing up believing they're not good enough, they don't measure up, they're not approved, given the right conditions, how might it be possible for them to end up living life thinking they're going to prove themselves to the world by becoming a despot which could lead to the killing of untold numbers of people given the right conditions. Saddam Hussein, some of us would remember him, uh, I guess uh, an image of, of arch evil and my understanding was that as a child the main way that people referred to him was bastard boy. And that's where he started and we know where he ended up. So because Satan's attacks are primarily on the truth, to counter them, it's not surprising in Ephesians 6 that all the pieces of armour are connected with God's truth, his word. The gospel. So what's the first one? The belt of truth. It's the truth about Christ's victory over evil for us. The breastplate of righteousness. What that, what's that about? That's the truth of Christ's righteousness that has defeated sin and evil. Shoes to run and proclaim what? The gospel. The truth. The shield of faith. What's the faith in? The faith is in the truth, the gospel of what God has done. The helmet of salvation. What salvation? The truth of Christ's victory for us. Finally, the sword of the spirit and says there, what's that about? What's the word of God? It's the truth. It's the sword that is used. So you see... All the pieces of armour are about opposing and combating lies and falsehood with the truth of God, with the gospel. And it's an almighty word with almighty power. So, again, we're going to sing in Luther's hymn about spiritual warfare. Uh, There's a line in there where Luther says, talking about the great terror of Satan, and Luther says, one little word shall fell him. One little word of the gospel. Uh, There's another story about Luther told in his, uh, uh, the writings that uh, came, uh, Table Talk, it was collected under that title. And... um, There was an occasion where Luther one night was woken up in the middle of the night and at the foot of his bed was was a terrible appearance of Satan in person there. And uh, Luther said, it's only you, threw his ink bottle at him and went back to sleep. Why? Because he stood in Christ and on his truth. How do we use this armour? Point three. Well, we have the full victory of Christ. We have all of these pieces of armour, the armour of his truth available to us. What we need to do daily is to take hold of it in faith and the power of the Holy Spirit and put it into action in our lives. We need to drill it deep into our lives and our bones. Its reality and power needs to get into our marrow. As Christians, 
we have this armour, but sometimes we ne- neglect to put it on. We've got to put it on. So how do we put that on? Well, as we've seen, it's all about truth. It's about getting into God's word. And Paul also mentions in our reading, verses uh, 18 to 20, it's about prayer. So getting into God's word, the Bible, prayer. What else does he mention? Being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit constantly. And another vital thing he mentions there, it's all in the context of the fellowship of all the saints. So this is not rocket science. Get into our Bibles. Uh, That means in a, a daily and personally in our relationship with God, reading and meditating on scripture. It means getting together with a close group of Christian friends to talk about it and encourage each other about it, to speak it into one another's lives, to encourage and prayer with one another, constantly having one another pray for us. So there's individually, there's with a group of close Christian friends and then with the whole church as well, gathering for the preaching of God's word, the worship of God's people, the prayers of God's people, the sacraments where God's word comes to us in visible form. We're going to have that a little later on in Holy Communion in all of these ways. So we can't expect to function or be strong as Christians without these, without getting into the Word of God, the Bible, prayer, receiving the Spirit, relying on the Spirit, being in fellowship with other Christians. We can't survive without these things. But just thought some examples of how that might be that we put the pieces of armour into action in our lives. Are you ever impatient with anyone? Why? It's because we think and feel, might not say it out loud, might just be buried down deep inside us, but we think and we feel that person is a fool and we get angry with them. There's the lie. What if instead we told ourselves the truth? We are no less capable of that as they are of foolishness and we have been at times. And consider the truth, let the truth sink in of God's infinite grace and forgiveness and patience to us. Well then we can and we ought to be as gracious and patient with one another, however foolish they might appear, because we can be just the same. Get hold of that lie and not act on it. Put it aside and override it with truth. Be gracious and patient with people. What about, are you ever worried? Ever worry about anything? Something goes wrong, you know, and we tell ourselves that we're hopeless and disaster's going to happen. I know all about that. I'm a pessimist. Just talk to Catherine. Why do we worry about stuff? Well, because because of pride, essentially. Because we can't be perfect as we think would be best. If, if things would just go this way, it would be perfect for me. They're not going to go that way, so we, we, we get angry and we spite God and ourselves and so we determine, no, nah, this is going to be a disaster, it's going to fail again. It's kind of a self-sabotage to spite ourselves and to spite God because of pride. Well, what if we replace that lie with the truth that God promises the best for you and me and all of us as a gift of his grace? You know, we think we know how life ought to turn out best for us. What do we know? God knows best. 
and he, he lifts us up. We don't have to raise ourselves up. We don't have to prove ourselves to others in pride. We can trust in him, be content in him and we will discover that that is the best. And we'll find a new freedom from worry, worrying about stuff and a new cheerful hopefulness. What about one other situation we might put that armour into action? Are we ever tempted? Are you ever tempted? Why? Is It's because we, we think and feel deep down that that wrong thing we're tempted by that that is important, it is vital, it is essential for us to be happy and complete in life. That's the lie. And it comes because we haven't known the full depths of God's presence and purpose, his love, his glory in our life as the thing that can fill us to overflowing. So do you see we're empty? We're not taking in all that God has given us. We're we're trying to look for it in other places, but they can't fulfil what God alone can do and so we're empty and so we're hungry and so we look to those false things. We imagine if I have that, that's going to fill me. That's the lie. What if we contemplated the truth of God's fullness? If we let it sink into us, the substance and the beauty of God's grace and love, his delight in us, his gifts to us, if we let that fill us and overflow us, then that would overshadow, that would displace the lie and the temptation. Just to finish where we started with the true ultimate warrior, Jesus Christ. God is the warrior against his enemies and our enemies. But you know, when God's people go against him, he's also a warrior against them, us, when we stand in opposition to him. But Jesus came and he stood in our place as though he were the greatest sinner and he had the sword of judgment fall upon him so that it would not fall upon us and we could be saved and we could be forgiven. That is the love of the greatest warrior for us and we're going to let that love conquer us and win us to loving allegiance to him. How did he fight and win that battle? Well, he fought it with love. He fought against evil and violence with love and weakness in giving himself to be put to death on the cross and in that way overcame evil. Well, therefore... We ought to fight the battle in the same way. Don't fight evil with evil. That just shows that we're as bad as the as the evil. But oppose it with good. Love and forgive your enemies. Don't hate. Just on the Olympic opening game, contro- uh, the opening of the Olympic Games controversy. Uh, we know there was much outcry from offended Christians about it. And there's no comment on Ray's prayer earlier. He prayed about that. And it's right that it's something that we should pray doesn't happen and goes away. I know there are different stories. Some say it was a, you know, a deliberate mocking of Christ in the Last Supper. Some others have given a different story. But I was very interested to hear Australian Christian commentator John Dixon say this, that if it was the deliberate intention of them to mock and shame Christ, then they were 2,000 years too late. 
and he made the point no human being could mock Jesus more than the mockery Jesus took upon himself there in the cross. And Jesus did that for all who mock him through history and for us. Every sin, every one of our sins is mocking Jesus. But Jesus did that for us in love. So how ought we respond? Ought we to respond to the situation at the Olympic Games? Uh, should we respond with hateful rage? No, hate only Satan. Don't hate people. Love them. That's what Christ did. So let's conquer evil with the truth of Christ's saving love offered to us and all people. Amen.